the PC recording is started. Could you please start the cloud? Cloud has started. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Jones, could you give us the opening, please? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Technology. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their videos? And to minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. And if you wish to submit a testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. And again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. And thank you for your cooperation. And Chair, we are ready to begin. Great. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I am Council Member Holden, Chair of the Committee on Technology. I want to welcome you all to our hearing today. Uh, we will focus on smart cities technology. Uh, we live in a rapidly changing world where smart cities are becoming a new normal, connecting our physical world and the digital world. People often ask, what is a smart city? Well, uh, while the answer is not always clear cut, smart city technology could affect many aspects of city operation, including mass transit, sanitation, waste management, and public safety. It could be everything from big data, mobile applications, from government services to the Internet of Things or IoT, such as sensors, cameras, smart meters, trash cans, and even self-driving cars. The concept of smart city technology provides innovative solutions to old problems such as congestion, parking, waste, and uh, energy management, as well as efficient distribution of government services. Whether we like it or not, the sudden emergence of the coronavirus pandemic has created a need for all industries and especially cities to pivot towards digital transformation. With the growing innovative technology, there will be a day when we will see a more digital New York, a New York where residents will be able to pay their parking ticket, make a complaint about garbage collection, improve booking of appointments for city services like SNAP, and tax exemptions and find out about tax exemptions. And uh, most pressing today, find and book the nearest appointment for the COVID-19 vaccine, all at your finger fingertips. On that note, I recently participated in a joint press conference with the city's public advocate, Jermani Williams, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer and Beta NYC criticizing the vaccines rollout in the city. We highlighted the issues with vaccinefinder.nyc and the fact that the website was time consuming, not entirely efficient, and basically just a glorified store locator. We also learned that several tech talents in the city, in city government were not asked to contribute to the rollout's back end portion. If we are to declare war on the COVID-19, we must embark on wartime efforts. These efforts should be should have involved using the bright minds that we already have in technology in and out of government to create a portal in which those who qualify for vaccines could locate a vaccine center and book an appointment all within three steps or less. The city continues to lag and this is unacceptable. Smart city technologies collect and analyze a massive amount of data on city re residents. That of course comes with privacy and security concerns. Privacy and security risks Privacy and security risks are essential, um, but might not be eliminated entirely. Um, however, we should make sure that those issues are mitigated by imp implementing the proper technology um, to protect the sensitive information. Uh, we should ensure that the benefits provided by smart city technology outweigh the cost. This technology is being implemented today and will be used in the future. Understanding what this entails, including the, what technologies exist, uh, the benefits of their use, and the utilization risks are critical for New York City. I wish uh, to work together with the administration on this important issue and look forward to hearing the, va uh, the valuable testimonies from the industry experts, academia, and uh, community advocates. Um, we are joined by Council Member Yeager and Council Member Eric Gullrich. Um, I wish to thank uh, our technology committee staff, Council Irene Bahofsky, uh, policy, policy analyst Charles Kim, 
and finance analyst Florentine Kabor uh, for their hard work in preparing for this hearing. Also, my chief of staff, Daniel Casina, and communications uh, legislative director, Kevin Ryan. Now I'll turn it uh, over to committee counsel, Irene Bohofsky, who will go over procedural items for this hearing. Thank you, Chair Holden. I'm Irene Bajewski, the counsel to the Committee on Technology, and I will be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you're called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. Please be aware that there could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called as I announce the panelists. We will be first hearing testimony from the administration, followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask questions of the administration or a specific panelists, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you. You will we will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time to take the answer the question. Also, please note that all panelists, aside from those from the administration, will be limited to five minute timer so that we might accommodate all who have registered to testify. When you are called to testify, please state your name and the organization you represent for the record. We will now call representative from the administration to testify. We will be hearing today testimony from John Paul Farmer, Chief Technology Officer of New York City. At this time, I will administer the affirmation. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member question, questions? Mr. Farmer? I do. Thank you. You might begin when ready. Thank you, Irene. Good afternoon, Chair Holden and committee members. I'm John Paul Farmer, the Chief Technology Officer for the City of New York. I'm pleased to be back to discuss the topic of smart cities and New York City's leading role in shaping the use of emerging technologies to benefit residents. Smart cities, quote unquote, is a term used differently by various cities and organizations engaged in the field. In terms of New York City's efforts in this field, my focus today will be on the city's work in the area of the Internet of Things, or IoT, where New York City leads nationally and internationally Further opportunities and challenges for the city are expected as this new set of technologies continues to develop and grow in use. In addition to encompassing different priorities for different cities, the term smart city is also evolving. As technology develops further, so does what it means, so does, does what it means to be a smart city. That's why a city must continually be evaluating, modifying, and improving its infrastructure initiatives and approaches in order to carry the banner of a smart city. The mayor's office of the CTO has focused on building and improving the connectivity infrastructure that is needed, that is absolutely necessary to operate as a smart city. We have developed the framework for how a city can use this connectivity to employ and deploy the emerging group of technologies known as the Internet of Things. At the beginning of Mayor de Blasio's administration, he set forth the goal of bringing universal broadband to New York City, which led to the development of the first ever comprehensive municipal broadband planning roadmap, the New York City Internet Master Plan, which was issued in 2020. In the Internet Master Plan, the city identifies the neighborhoods in which infrastructure the city needs to build and attract broadband development in order to reverse the digital redlining that has existed for far too long across the five boroughs. Equitable connectivity is a foundational component to being a smart city. Now, why is it critical? It's critical because widespread availability of broadband is necessary to connect the devices, sensors, and systems that make up the internet of things. Without widespread connectivity, 
communities are unable to fully use these new IoT technologies, unable to receive new services, and maybe underrepresented in key data sets that the city uses to inform its actions. The city is about to issue its first comprehensive smart cities plan, the New York City IoT strategy, which will provide the framework for the use of IoT in the city. The IoT strategy builds on a multi-year body of work from the mayor's office of the CTO, including the IoT guidelines that were issued in 2018 and a series of engagements with the tech industry, including challenges and pilots with other city agencies, as well as policies developed as part of a multi-city, uh, multi-agency IoT working group. The mayor's office of the CTO has taken these actions because we recognize that IoT represents a constantly evolving set of technologies that the city can and should use to create more accurate, localized and real-time data, which will help the city increase operational efficiencies, make more impact and more representative policy decisions. Often IoT devices are deployed to monitor a set of environmental conditions that when compiled into a data set will provide never before collected perspective. One example of these technologies is the deployment of sensors on city vehicles to monitor air quality in neighborhoods in order to provide information on the impact of traffic flow, times of day, or weather conditions. Another example is the use of sensors to measure tides and water flow to help the city improve its flood mitigation planning and better target its resiliency efforts. In addition to providing new information and insights, A key feature of these IoT devices and systems is that they can provide real-time data, which allows users to understand changes in conditions on a day-to-day or week-to-week basis. In the New York City IoT strategy, the city recognizes the significant opportunity that it has to ensure data produced from IoT are interoperable with other data sets. Creating systems for sharing data and ensuring their compatibility will exponentially increase the ability of the city to understand up to the minute conditions and take the appropriate actions. Not only will that allow agencies to target operations to the most critical and influential actions, it will increase efficiency and ultimately lower costs. One way that IoT device deployments help New York become a smarter city is by making possible greater understanding of conditions at this hyper-local neighborhood level. For instance, devices may be deployed to understand the impacts of of traffic patterns on temperatures of a neighborhood, how that's distinct relative to its geographic conditions. And communities too may benefit from understanding this type of hyper-local environmental data generated by these devices because they can often be shared with the public. As with all new technologies, it's critical for the city to have a framework that builds a coordinated system maximizes benefit for New Yorkers, protects the digital rights of residents, and ensures continued relevance as technology develops. As the market produces new IoT devices that can assist in the city's work, agencies need a framework that can accommodate new categories of devices, functions, and applications matching their areas of work. The NYC IoT strategy balances these priorities and provides the city with the vision that will help it serve its people ever better and continue to evolve as a smart city. I'd be happy to take your questions about this emerging body of work and New York City's ongoing leadership in the field. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Farmer. And um, just a few questions and then I'll turn it over to some, uh, some of my colleagues. Oh, by the, by the way, we've been uh, joined by council member and my Queens colleague, uh, Paul Vallone. Um, Mr. Farmer, one of your initiatives, you mentioned that you touched upon the universal broadband. Um, We had a separate hearing on broadband in October. Could you update us on the progress, like the million dollar question, when can we expect to get it? Of course. Uh, Thank you, Chair Holden, for that question. As you know, uh, as I made clear in my testimony, as from all of our conversations previously, you know how much uh, I care about and how focused my office is on universal broadband. Uh, it's a it's a problem that has been created over decades, and it takes uh, an all hands on deck approach to solving it. Uh, we are we are doing that. The Internet Master Plan is the framework. We've made progress uh, with the RFEI that we worked with NYCHA and EDC on in 2020. 
Uh, results uh, from that are, are coming very shortly. Uh, and then we will be releasing in February the RFP, the Universal Solicitation for Broadband uh, that, that we committed to when we released the Internet Master Plan that the mayor has uh, doubled down on. Uh, and that will be coming in February. And that's going to invite in everyone, uh, companies big and small, community organizations. Uh, and it's going to put the assets of 17 different city agencies on the table so that we can leverage these assets to ensure that we get uh, the equipment in place and the infrastructure in place to serve particularly underserved neighborhoods, but ultimately everyone with more low cost affordable options. So can you, can you uh, your best guess on when we could say that we have universal broadband in the city? Do you have a month? Do you have a sure. year? Um, okay. I don't have a month. Is, is a the, yeah, the simple answer is I don't have a month. I know the mayor has previously said 2025 is a target. Uh, this is going to happen step by step. This is going to happen step by step. We're going to be taking chunks out of the problem at a time. And we will start with our uh, announcement on the RFEI results, which will take out uh, a chunk specifically of uh, NYCHA households uh, that will suddenly be connected to affordable broadband they did not have before. Uh, and then throughout 2021, we will be taking out more and more chunks uh, from uh, the, the too large size of a population that's currently unconnected. And then that will continue in the, in the years ahead. So it'll be rolled out in certain areas of the city, little by little. That, that's how it's going to be. That's right. And we're prioritizing, working with the task force on racial inclusion and equity, we are prioritizing the neighborhoods that the administration has identified as particularly in need. Uh, obviously, during COVID, we've seen just how absolutely essential having a connection is. It, it's, a, it, it's necessary to get health care. It's necessary uh, to continue doing your job in many cases. And it's going to be necessary as people reskill and retrain and re-enter the workforce, perhaps in, in different lines of work. And that's why we're so, so focused on the issue and prioritizing the communities that need it most. Okay. Uh, you mentioned in your testimony, you, you have an IOT working group. Uh, who's on this? Who leads it? What agencies are involved in this group? Uh, so my office, the mayor's office of the CTO has convened this IOT working group. And uh, there are, I wanna say over a dozen different agencies involved. Department of Transportation, Department of uh, Sanitation, Mayor's Office of Resiliency. Uh, it's, a, it's a list I'd be happy to share with you. Okay, yeah, I'd like to see that because uh, I didn't know you had one. It's got a, you know, at least uh, it looks like we're, we're you know, getting somewhere now. Um, what's, by the way, um, what steps have been taken to modernize the city's technology, uh, the infrastructure, considering the pandemic? Uh, have we done anything differently since the pandemic? Are you specifically asking about IoT? Yeah, yeah, yeah like what the technology to keep up, you know, to, to serve, to actually uh, gain a foothold on the, uh, uh, against the pandemic. Like, yeah. you know, we talk about, in my testimony, I talked about we have to get into a wartime mentality against the COVID. Have you done that? Have you done, like, sp have you sped up things that you ordinarily yeah. would have taken a while to do? It's a good question. And, and ultimately, when you think about Internet of Things technology, you think about what a smart city is all about, at the core of it is data. Um, when we talk about devices, the devices exist in order to provide data in a real-time nature, uh, granular, hyper-local, that can be actionable for the city. And sometimes that action takes place automatically. Sometimes it just informs city decision-making. Um, that's the place where we focus during the pandemic, is on being more data-informed data informed about everything from PPE stock on a real-time basis to understand uh, back in the springtime where we were low, where we were doing okay, what procurements were underway, deliveries that were expected in the coming days, as well as estimating demand. So that kind of data awareness was something that was really essential during the peak of, uh, of New York City's experience with the pandemic in the spring of 2020. Um, we also worked with private companies and universities on the data that they had uh, some of that was produced by Internet of Things devices, by connected devices. An example of that is um, mobility data. So Facebook, for example, has uh, mobility data that they shared with certain academic researchers. We then worked with those academic researchers to understand, again, in, in close to real time, where we were seeing more movement at an, in an aggregate sense. So this is not personally identifiable information. This is, this is aggregated data to understand where in the city um, during the initial phases of stay at home orders, et cetera, we were seeing more activity or less activity. And that helped us direct 
our interventions, our messaging to understand whether we needed to get messaging out in different languages, for example, to reach certain communities. So that's an example of leveraging the data that comes out of Internet of Things devices uh, to make the city more responsive, more quickly, and target our resources where they can have the, the greatest impact. Thanks. Thanks. So uh, regarding go, going back to the IoT um, work group um, or task force, mm -hmm. um, what what's the goal of the group? What, what's your you, you set a, a series of goals, and um, can we get can we see the meeting agenda um, for for the, how many meetings took place and so forth? Sure, I, I don't have that information with me right now, Chair Holden, but I'm happy to get that to you in terms of the frequency of meeting and, uh, and again, the full list of uh, who's been involved. Uh, in terms of the goal, the goals are, are pretty straightforward and that's to encourage the healthy use of IoT. We recognize that these are technologies that can be incredibly beneficial to help agencies meet their missions and serve New Yorkers better. We also recognize that it needs to be done in the right way. It needs to be done in a way that protects people's uh, privacy, certainly, uh, focuses on cybersecurity, ultimately the full range of digital rights that we care about, making sure those are looked after and protected. So we view our role as a, a convener, uh, a coach in some ways, helping to coach agencies with the expertise that the mayor's office and the CTO has to share that with them and make sure that they understand the best practices. And then ultimately, this is uh, a network of people and organizations that have, have equity, have an interest in this issue and are going to be at the table as new policies get developed. And as, as I mentioned in my testimony, this is an evolving space, the technology is evolving, the field is evolving, and as new best practices come about or new technologies come to the forefront, we need to make sure that we have the right policies in place and the IoT working group is a, is a key part of informing that. Um, just in looking at the city agencies uh, adapting to the re, uh, remote work environment you've seen during the pandemic, um, which agencies uh, that you looked at are doing the best job to adapt to the remote environment, would you say? I'm actually very proud of the work that the city overall has done to adapt to remote. Um, I think as, as most people here know, this was not the standard way that uh, New York City government operated. Uh, most work was done in person, in offices. Uh, a lot of offices really didn't have policies in place or um, uh, the systems in place to support remote work. And um, it's something that my office, uh, I think we, we may have been the first office to, to go to all remote uh, during the, the very beginning of the pandemic hitting New York. Um, and then we spent a lot of time supporting other agencies and making sure that uh, they were uh, learning whatever best practices we knew about. And we were bringing in resources from outside, from various private sector companies that could help support agencies as they as they made that transition. In terms of a specific agency, I, I, I don't know that it's that clear that, that some are doing so well and, and some are doing um, uh, not so well. I, I think overall um, it's, it's worked quite well and, and we've seen that. Uh, there, there may have been varying speeds of how fast agencies got to a place of comfort with remote work. But at this point, my understanding and, and what I'm hearing is that it's working, it's working well uh, for a lot of agencies. Uh, but obviously, if there's, if there's any need for us to continue to provide support, we're always here and we do our best to make sure that our colleagues know that. Yeah, but I, I would think that you would say some agencies have adapted better than others uh, because of just who they are sometimes and who they, what they have going for them or, or their staff. And you know, just evaluating staff to how they perform remotely? Or should they, you know, so, uh, is there somebody looking at this saying, well, you know, this agency shouldn't be working remotely. This agency could work um, in a central location yeah. as long as they social distance. I mean, who's deciding that? Is the agency's deciding that or are you deciding it? Um, who's overseeing it's a good, all of it's that? A, it's a good question. And I do agree with what you said in that some functions are simply easier to do remotely than others. And, and we recognize that inspection, for example, Someone's going to do restaurant inspections. Maybe there are certain aspects of the job you can do remotely, but some of that stuff just, you got to be in person. You got to go do the inspection in person. Uh, our job, we don't view our role as the mayor's office of the CTO as uh, oversight or auditing in most cases. It's generally that we provide expertise and support uh, when, when requested. Uh, so we've, we've done that. We provide frameworks for how people can think about the technologies uh, and, and understand, again, best practices for how to use them. Um, but I, I don't view our role as 
checking up on a regular basis with the, the dozens and dozens of offices and agencies to, to see what their, their current status is. So whose role then would, would that be in, in government? Well, ultimately, it, it's the job of each agency and the, and the commissioners that lead those agencies to make sure that things are working and that if they need help, they make that known, uh, whether they maybe they have a relationship uh, with me and they reach out directly to me, or maybe they reach out to City Hall and their deputy mayor uh, and, and make that known, in which case um, that the folks in City Hall will pull in the right part of the administration, whether that's my office or another, uh, to, to help provide that service. But, but ultimately, we, we have to uh, place some trust in the personnel and the leadership that we've got in the agencies. Are there any particular new technologies uh, that the city invested in to make government more uh, accessible uh, in this new environment? Um, because, you know, just, just the rollout of the, I mean, I was critical of the, the, the website um, on the vaccine website, because I think um, you know that we got a lot of complaints. So every, every council office got complaints, especially from seniors, but um, anybody trying to find the vaccine. Uh, so, what have we invested in new technologies since the pandemic to to really um, have a better working city? Well, I think part of what we're talking about here today with IoT is some of these are new investments, looking at air quality sensors, looking at uh, flood monitoring. Um, we've also done, as we just talked about, remote work requires a whole new set of technologies that hasn't been used before. So you look at, we're using Zoom right now. Um, we use Microsoft Teams every single day uh, to connect with our colleagues and, and hold meetings in ways that we, we couldn't do before. Uh, in terms of the, the, the moment right now where we look at uh, the vaccine and the vaccination process, at the root of this, we, we need to recognize that as the mayor has pointed out, we as a city need to receive more doses of vaccine from the federal government. Um, that's ultimately what is needed. Uh, in terms of the technology, the role of technology in supporting this, um, we need to make sure that we've got a user-centered experience. And that's true of everything that we do. We've got to make things as easy as possible for New Yorkers. Uh, sometimes there are rules that are, that are given to us that make that tough, that require some amount of uh, information to be collected, some verification. And when you look at what's going on right now with the the, uh, the way people need to um, attest that they are in the group that is qualified to receive vaccination right now, that requires a certain amount of, uh, uh, of red tape, if you wanna call it that. And the best solution to this is for us to receive more doses of vaccine, because ultimately this is about getting shots in arms. It's about uh, making sure that New Yorkers are protected. Uh, we are fortunate that we've got a lot of expertise around New York City government in this space. I appreciate Chair Holden, your letter uh, where you pointed out a number of those different groups that have expertise. And when we look at all of the work that the city needs to be doing uh, from the connectivity front and universal broadband to uh, resiliency and climate change um, to how we deliver healthcare, um, all of those are important and we need to make sure that we are dividing and conquering, if you will, uh, but ultimately that we are available, that our skills and, and knowledge is available to our colleagues. And I'm confident that they know it is and that the right people are being pulled into conversations to make sure that we can deliver a user-centered experience, which is what New Yorkers deserve. But you understand the frustration. Uh, have you used that uh, vaccine finder? Uh, I, I guess you have, or your staff has. Um, can you point out some problems with it? Because I have, I've used it, and I've asked a lot of people, and every, most across the board, people are frustrated. I hear you, and I have, I have, uh, I've gone to it. I, I'm not eligible for for the vaccine, so I have not had a need to uh, sign up anywhere. But uh, I've looked at, at how uh, how it works, and um, you know, I think this is always going to be a challenge when you're dealing with a distributed network of of providers. Uh, and so there's, there's that balance uh, of, of how do you do something quickly that allows people to, um, to use it, you know, as, as soon as these vaccines are made available uh, with the question of depth and sophistication and complexity. And um, I, I'm, I'm sure that the people who worked on it 
uh, took into account the various options and uh, and went with what they thought was best. But they're also hearing the feedback. You know, they're hearing the feedback from from you and from others. And um, and I'm I'm confident that they're making uh, the appropriate adjustments. Yeah, but was the CTO's office, your office, involved in the user centered experience? Um, because you can see the problems with it. Because uh, you know. Have you identified a huge problem? Because I have, where you go off and you go to a third party and you fill out pages and pages of information only to find that you're at a dead end. So you've wasted sometimes half hour on each location, a half hour, hour. And you know, you, you in, the, in the world, we shouldn't, in, in the technology world, we have the technology to make it easier, not harder. We're making it harder with, with this uh, site. Uh, so if you went through it, you know, what is was your office involved in the creation of, or at least helping out with that? No, we were not involved. And uh, also, Bingo. this is something that other agencies have been uh, leading. All right. On. So you see, that's my that's my problem here, that we could make it easier. You're obviously the CTO. You have a wealth of uh, experience. You can you could um, critique this site, say, you know, what is not working or even I mean, I, I think that the administration should have said, look, we're going to get the vaccine and in two months, you know, we gotta we gotta prepare for this. Come up with how to administer it, how to, you know, what technology we can use to help out and get it, you know, get it to as many people as possible. And let's plan this. I I, I looked at that and, and what I I described it and I had you know design professionals look at it. It's nothing more than a glorified store locator, which is why I said. Um, and it often le left you high and dry. Like I filled out, I went to a third party site, I guess it was. Um, and I filled out all my information, and they, in the end, they said, you're not eligible for the Moderna uh, vaccine. I didn't ask for it, the Moderna vaccine. I just asked for a vaccine because I'm over 65, and I, and if I'm having problems, and I know somewhat about, about technology, if I'm having problems, what about somebody who has no experience in doing this? I mean, you're hitting your head against a wall. And, I, um, I, I absolutely hear you loud. I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but this is this is important that we get this right. We still have to vaccinate a heck of a lot of people here, and mm -hmm. we we should have the technology. Like eventually, I'm talking about a portal that will do all your the one stop shopping in New York City. Tell you, you know, like I mentioned in my testimony, I don't want to repeat myself, but this isn't this is something basic basic stuff. In and certainly to you, somebody that's in technology, so you must be frustrated. I don't want to get you in trouble, but you must be frustrated with this. Well, let me just say that I, I agree that this is an important issue, and it's one that we all care about. We care about it for ourselves, for our communities, for our city, for our families, uh, and we want to make sure that it's done right. Uh, ultimately, this is uh, something that I'm happy to bring back uh, your concerns and make, uh, make sure that my colleagues are aware. Uh, ultimately, you know, when you look at how the city operates, uh, we are one one team, one office among many. And uh, we do our best to support the good work of others. Uh, if there is a role, a larger role for us to play, we are, we are certainly open to it. Um, uh, but ultimately, I think that the best I can do is to, to bring this back uh, and make clear to my colleagues uh, your, your point of view. So if you're, you, uh, if you're not involved with the, that, uh, that site, and if you didn't have anything to do with it, who, who is responsible to oversee that? Is it just health and hospitals? Um, who's doing it? Who's overseeing it? Uh, I, I can check and get back to you. I, uh, I don't have- uh, See, Well, that, that's alarming when the CTO doesn't know who's overseeing this. Don't you well, want that? Well, I, I don't want to misspeak and I don't want to leave someone out that's important to mention or vice versa. Uh, but ultimately, as I pointed out, we are an organization that exists to support agencies so they can do their jobs better, so they can have access to expertise, uh, and, and frameworks that allow them to achieve their mission. Uh, so in terms of monitoring and oversight, uh, there may be cases where that is something that we are asked to do, but on our day-to-day, -day, that's, that's, that's not the relationship that we have with most other agencies. Yeah, you know, um, are we measuring New Yorkers' satisfaction with services that agencies are delivering? Just not only on this site, but are we, do we measure that? Do we have questionnaires that, that we're, somebody is looking at um, to, to critique? I, I critique that site, obviously, publicly. And I think the um, uh, public advocate did and the, the, borough, the Manhattan Borough President did. 
Um, and I think others have. But how do we measure this just broadly? How are we measuring New Yorkers' satisfaction with services uh, that agencies are delivering? Well, some agencies for some of their services have questionnaires that are online that are part of the process. It's important not to gum up the works with too much of that because you want people to get a service quickly uh, and you want to get enough feedback, but not overdo it, not force everyone to provide feedback all the time where you're really creating a burden for users. Uh, so some agencies uh, have that in place and use it um, uh, pretty well. There might be opportunities to, to do more of that. We're also thinking about analytics. So how can we actually infer feedback, infer how well something is working without having someone spend 30 or 60 or 90 seconds of their time doing a survey. And so looking at analytics on our websites and being able to follow the user experience, recreate the user experience uh, and identify any areas for improvement, that's something that we're prioritizing. Okay, yeah, you spoke about ensuring trust with the community. Um, uh, one of the projects we heard about uh, is labeling IoT, Internet of Things devices that are installed on street furniture. Um, did, are you labeling any, uh, are you la uh, labeling, how many devices ha did you label uh, in, in uh, street furniture? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It's a good um, point that you're bringing up, which is that trust is so important that when you've got a new technology uh, that's being deployed, a lot of times, you know, New Yorkers see something and they don't understand the value that it brings to them. And sometimes that can actually lead to conspiracy theories and other um, uh, distrust of technology or, or distrust of government. We want to make sure that we're as upfront as possible, as clear as possible with why something new is in someone's community uh, so that they can quickly, concisely understand uh, the benefit it has, or maybe start looking at uh, something, show them somewhere online where they can go to learn more. Uh, so one, this can spur interest from high school kids who might then get interested in this technology and go and delve in and learn more, which is great. Um, but two, it just makes clear to people why it's there. And we're, we're currently looking uh, to start this quarter, a pilot with uh, the Mayor's Office of Resiliency on flood monitoring. And that is, uh, I believe, the first example, or at least the first example at scale, where we are labeling uh, the devices and, uh, and then assessing the response from people in the community in terms of how useful they find that. So you haven't labeled anything yet? Uh, no, it, some, some things have been labeled in the past, but doing it at scale and standardizing the process, this is the beginning of, of that process. Hey, I get calls from constituents all the time. I have this box on my, the pole mm -hmm. outside my house. I'm afraid of it. Um, some people say, oh, it's 5G. It's going to you know, give me cancer. You, know, you hear all these things. But I think if we had some kind of just a little small sign or some label, whatever, so people can know what, what the heck this is outside their home. Uh, yeah. What is that on the pole? Um, you know, all sorts of rumors go around, uh, as you know, with social media. So this is, this is uh, we should at least do this. Um, and um, uh, j just, um, could you please speak about the pilot program uh, with MIT called City Scanner? Do you, could you give us an update on that? So City Scanner has gone well. That's uh, a pilot program that we launched in early 2020 with the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, uh, managing the, the fleet vehicles for dozens of agencies, and MIT, so the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And we used MIT tech that had been built to put that onto uh, fleet vehicles that are operated by, by DCAS and, um, and to check and see how useful this really was. And the initial uh, the, the initial data that we got showed we were able to collect roughly 100,000 data points in the course of a couple of, uh, in the course of a month. And those 100,000 data points should compare to the traditional way of measuring air quality, which is, I believe it's a dozen static sensors in 12, just in 12 places in the city. They don't move. They're in the same place and you get a very limited number of data points, obviously there. We got 100,000 that were block by block, um, uh, time stamped, so we could create a much more granular understanding of the air quality in communities. And that's really important because it allows us to understand uh, that not every block in the Bronx is experiencing the same thing at the same time. And the more we can understand where the challenges are in air quality, the more we can then address it 
we can zero in on what might be causing it, whether that be traffic pollution or uh, some kind of uh, factory of sorts, whatever the, the cause is, that hyper granular data that the city scanner pilot has given us is, uh, is really, really useful. And the second phase of that is now underway because we saw the success in the first phase, the pilot experience, and now we're doing more of it uh, with those same partners of DCAS and MIT. So there's environment, do you have environmental se uh, sensors on city vehicles that you're using um, that, that can measure not only air quality or, or just efficiency? Is that, is that being done? I think you mentioned that one, once before. Well, yeah, so that's what I'm, I'm describing now is the city oh, scale okay. so the vehicles. Air quality Sorry. sensors on city vehicles. So they're vehicles, they're not on, on street furniture. That's right. No, on, on vehicles, and that's actually how we can get such good coverage is that they're driving down, just, just doing their jobs. This isn't even sending them somewhere. Just by the nature of these vehicles doing their jobs, people driving around the city, you can collect data on so many of the different blocks of the city at different times of day. Uh, and then those data sets are, are just uh, incredibly rich in a way that we've never had before. Are we going to see the, like the, the release of data on this project from this project? Uh, yeah, I would, I would expect that. I would expect that. So uh, I don't know if we'll release the entire raw data set. Uh, we need to clean it. And so, for example, if we've got different vehicles in different places, we, we just need to sort it out and make sure that the, we, we can create a longitudinal data set that, that makes more sense uh, to a user. And, uh, and, and we would expect that we will be releasing um, the right parts of it. Uh, as open data. Um, that's that's certainly part of what we believe in, uh, what the city of New York believes in, and uh, we intend to do that. So the data will be available on the open data, data portal? You, you yes, I can commit that a form of it will be available, yes. Or, okay, because uh, th that'd be something I'm interested in, uh, everybody is, about uh, certainly the environment in their neighborhoods and so forth. Uh, um, so, you know, one of the strategies that you mentioned was uh, joining the city's coalition of, uh, for digital rights. What is your involvement in the city's uh, coalition for digital rights organization? I'm glad you brought that up. It's, it's an important organization. It's one that New York City co-founded along with Amsterdam and Barcelona. And for the last uh, two years, the cities have been growing it, have been signing on additional member cities from around the world. We now have over 50 cities worldwide uh, from a bunch of different continents that have signed on because they care about digital rights, and these are human rights in the internet age. I think the one that gets talked about, well, the two that get talked about the most would be privacy and cybersecurity. Uh, those are absolutely important ones. There are also principles there around transparency and accountability. Uh, so a, a bunch of openness, a bunch of other things that, that are really important too. And we have to recognize that sometimes these principles can be in tension with one another, that it, to maximize the privacy, for example, might mean not doing open data. Uh, to maximize cybersecurity might mean you actually lose some of the effectiveness or, or, or the equity. Uh, and so balancing these digital rights, making sure that we are protecting the needs and interests of, of New Yorkers is something we care a lot about. And we're really happy to see that so many other cities around the world are thinking about these same issues. And we're able to then uh, share best practices, share ideas, share approaches with them. Uh, and we're currently looking at uh, experiments that are being done in, um, in these different cities to understand how they're approaching these issues that we care about here too. Uh, so I wanna follow up with uh, the ADS uh, issue. Um, your office works with the algorithms management and policy officer. Uh, we still do not have an answer of what agencies are using the ADS uh, syst uh, software. Um, when do you think your office could supply us that list? That's a good question and uh, appreciate the, the interest in the work of the ADS task force. And I think it's an important um, step that the step number of steps the city has taken uh, on this front. Ultimately, the mayor's office of operations is where the, the AMPO uh, is seated. And, and they're the ones who are issuing reports, uh, have issued reports in the past, will be issuing uh, additional reports. And they're ultimately the ones who, uh, who, who bear that responsibility. Um, I'll just have a few more questions and I'll, I'll pass it over to my colleagues. The, the city invested in a project together with T-Mobile that provided 10,000 NYCHA seniors with free internet connected tablets to uh, 
connect digitally uh, with family and friends. We understand that your office conducted trainings and workshops this summer. Um, how many people attended these trainings and, and workshops? Well, thank you for asking about the, the project because this is one that is near and dear to my heart, uh, making sure that some of the most vulnerable people in our communities, uh, older adults living in, in NYCHA, uh, particularly those living alone or living only with other older adults, that they have access to technology too, and that they can, especially during 2020, uh, and, and as we um, continue to fight this pandemic and make sure people stay safe in the process, that they uh, have the ability to access healthcare, to get groceries delivered, um, and to, to speak with friends and family and maintain those social bonds that are so important uh, to everyone's health. Um, so that's what the project was about and has been about. And as part of this, it's not just about the, the connected device, which is foundational. It's then helping ensure that people know how to use it. Um, so what we did is we worked with OATS, Older Adult Technology Services, a local nonprofit that's got uh, a lot of expertise and experience in the space of working with, with seniors. And they reached out to all 10,000. And uh, every single person got uh, outreach, direct outreach, uh, most of them multiple conversations, and they were invited to various kinds of trainings. And, and you can imagine people are starting from different places. So some folks needed help uh, just simply turning it on and identifying uh, how to find the email in there, uh, how to set up their own email account. Others were already you know, good with that, and they just wanted maybe some more sophisticated uh, abilities for how to do video chatting or uh, how to search for something of their particular interest. I know one of the in addition to finding a cardiologist or connecting with your kids and grandkids, uh, one of the, the stories we got was someone who was really, really into parrots and really wanted to do like deep dives into parrots. And, um, and Oates was able to help him do that. And that was something that was meaningful uh, to, that, to that gentleman. So they were used in a lot of different ways. The, the work that Oates in particular did, I think, deserves um, commendation in that they, they reached every single um, recipient, uh, and those recipients then chose to engage in, in various ways. So these trainings and workshops are continuing then, right? They are, yep. All right, good, good. Okay, I have one other question, then I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleagues. By the way, we've been joined by Councilman uh, Costa, Councilman Atides. Um, anybody else? Um, okay, just one other question. Um, we have an individual uh, registered for public testimony later today who will discuss combating quality of life issues like noise. Uh, like, and this is a near and dear to me because uh, I looked at it and I was, uh, I was very interested in this. Uh, she sent the, the committee information on smart sensors used in cities like Regina or Calgary in Canada, Beijing, Paris, and London, which um, these devices record decibel uh, levels um, take photographs, and then allows for police to track down and issue a summons to the culprit, which I, if any city that needs it, it's New York City. Do we, does, does this city uh, have technology like this? Or are we looking at it if we don't? Uh, thanks for the question, Chair Holden. So it's a good example of a, a sensor type. There are so many different sensor types. There are environmental sensors that we were talking about on fleet vehicles. There are vision sensors, motion sensors, location sensors, and, and there are sound, acoustic sensors as well. And um, an example from here in New York, a couple of examples, one would be uh, shot spotter, which I think a lot of folks are familiar with that the New York City Police Department uses, uh, uses acoustic sensors. Uh, another example would be the sonic program, Sounds of New York City. And, uh, and that is NSF, uh, National Science Foundation funded uh, and NYU is, is leading the way on that, the Sonic S-O-N-Y-C, uh, Sounds of New York City program. Um, I'm not aware that that's connected back uh, for enforcement the way uh, you just described in, in other cities, uh, but certainly there's a lot of interest in understanding, much like we're trying to understand air quality, understand um, the, our acoustic environment in a hyper-local way as well. And that's something else where Internet of Things acoustic sensors can be very helpful. Because noise can affect people, obviously, and affect their health. Absolutely. It's, it's documented. So um, I would hope that this type of technology, you know, and enforcement is possible, or at least on the horizon in New York City. You know, we, I don't know if you've noticed, I think you have, Everybody, every New Yorker has noticed these cars that backfire, 
and they sound like gunshots, but they're very loud mufflers. It's sort of uh, the trend now all over our streets. When you got one of these cars passing your, your house at two in the morning, it'll wake you up. Yeah. And so we have motorcycles. We have we have a lot of illegal vehicles on this uh, on our streets in the city. And this kind of technology would go a long way in, in kind of sort of corral that 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 behavior that we see a lot of people, and especially it's been magnified during the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, you have people speeding, but they're speeding with these noisy vehicles and so forth and cars uh, and trucks that backfire some purposely. Um, yeah. So that's why I think if, if you could look, your office could look into this technology and it would be a great enforcement tool, I think, to sort of get a, get a handle on this kind of behavior. Um, yeah. But, um, yeah, so I'll go back to the uh, our council. Do Are there questions from council members? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Holden and Mr. Farmer. I will now call on other council members to ask their questions in order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. If you would like to ask a question and you have not used the Zoom raise hand function, please raise it now. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. Sergeant at arm will keep a timer and we will let you know when your time is up. You should begin once you call. Once I have called on you and the surgeon has announced that you might begin before delivering your questions. And I see that Council Member Vallon has a question. Council Member Vallon, you may begin when you're ready. Time starts now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Holden and John. Happy Healthy New Year to you and the family. Thanks for your advice as always. Um, as usual, Chair Holden's having questions right on point. So I just wanna follow on <clears throat> what he's already started with and forgive me for jumping in a little bit late. But John, as, as we transition, right? I mean, a lot of this, the beginning of your testimony was the transitioning of the city to 5G, the infrastructure challenges that need to be made. Can you, can you describe what the difference is, what we have now and what needs to be done in order to prepare for the next level of 5G? Certainly, thank you for the question, uh, Council Member Vallone. Uh, as, as you pointed out just now, 5G, the internet of things, universal broadband, um, ultimately all of these often thought of as different technologies, uh, artificial intelligence is another one. They ultimately come together, uh, interact with one another. Some, in some places, the, the lines get blurry. Uh, when you think about 4G, what we have today, and 5G, uh, which is, is coming, um, one of the things to understand is that be, because of the type of spectrum being used, uh, it simply requires more equipment to spread the signal. Um, now, the signal, when it does get spread, has real advantages in terms of very, very high bandwidth and very low latency, so close to real-time feedback between device and person or device and device. Uh, and so in order to put in place the 5G network that uh, a number of people are, are excited about the potential of, um, that requires more equipment and in more places. And this is something that, for example, the, the Internet Master Plan imagines as it thinks about uh, not just poles, but also rooftops and street furniture, other types of spaces that we have here in New York City that could but be- John, who, who sets that parameter then? Who, who determines that infrastructure balance on whether it's poles, places of buildings to increase the bandwidth? How, how is that map figured out and how are we part of that process? So I don't know if there's one single answer. Uh, I, can, I can say what our office is doing on that front. And what our office is doing is the implementation of the Internet Master Plan, which is putting, uh, you may have joined after uh, I mentioned this earlier, but seven, the assets of 17 different agencies for the first time ever being um, made available for people to propose how they would use those, those assets. Um, well, not so much. I forgive I, only because of the five minute. I would let you, I'd let you keep going on that. But I, I'm looking for, listen, I started my political career when a cell phone tower popped up in my son's uh, grammar school without notice or warning to the parents and that set me off on a path of uh, involvement, let's just put it that way. And there was that, 
decade, I guess, in the mid-2000s when cell phone towers started popping all over the place, early 90s and 2000s, was a lot of confusion and fear for people as to what the radiation concerns would be, what the proximity to residential houses and places of worship and schools. Um, because we've grown and, and just how we've evolved with the use of technology, that cry is there, but not the same, but it's the concern will never go away. How, how have we determined now that there's going to be a higher demand and a higher usage for the 5G on what those rules and safety practices will be? Because eventually we did come up with some rules on where you could place them. And then there was a myriad of lawsuits that followed on, on enforcing those and who had, whether it was federal, state or local jurisdiction, it was not easy. But mm -hmm. at least what happened was the big companies, Verizon, Sprint, they didn't want the hassle. So eventually they would move on to another location. How, how are we determining the, those parameters of safety and location or where these will be located? So let me start with safety. Safety is absolutely critical, making sure that, uh, that, that no equipment is going into place that could risk someone's, someone's health or safety. Um, now that said, we recognize that this will not simply be replacing equipment that's already there. This will, this will be equipment in new places. And that is open for discussion, I think, at this point um, within the city, but also probably with the, the industry uh, groups themselves in terms of where they should be thinking about asking to deploy equipment. So they don't, they don't simply get to decide. It's, a, it's an ask. Um, but I, I don't think it's something that's just for us to have conversations about in this setting. I think it's, it's my own personal view here. I, th I think it's a broader conversation that needs to be had in society to make sure that we are developing approaches that, that, that deploy the technology um, in a way that it can create benefit, but do so in a way that protects people's health for sure and safety for sure, uh, but also their, their interests as, as residents in New York City. So Chair Holden, I, I would happily join in with you on, I think there's an opportunity there at the outset here where we have some exploratory conversation or legislation on the partnership of the location and that we are part of that conversation because we were not part of the initial cell phone tower placement conversations that played your neighborhood and mine. Um, and if that's being conceptually done now, now's a perfect time to do that. And then John, my last point would be, and I, because my time is up, would be the third party aspect of it with the bids and the contracts to the transformation. Uh, Council member Holden and mine are two jurisdictions that are plagued with old technology, especially with above line uh, power grids. Mm -hmm. is, is there an opportunity here as we transition to have the cost of that part of the contract when they go to a site to upgrade that site technologically and maybe work with Con Ed so that we're doing two things at once to upgrade essential services to communities instead of continually going back and, and ripping up locations and streets and sidewalks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think really interesting idea and one worth worth discussing. The place to discuss, I think, both the question of where it's appropriate to put equipment, but also these infrastructure questions and, and is this an opportunity um, to make a leap forward. The In the wake of the, the RFP that's coming out, I mentioned it's coming out in February, um, as that comes out and we get proposals back, that will then open up a, a back and forth, a negotiation period. Uh, and that's an opportunity for us uh, to make clear um, the interests of, of the city, uh, of the council, um, of the various communities in the city that are being affected, um, hopefully affected very positively. But that's the opportunity for us to do that in that back and forth period. Uh, and, and we will have a lot more information on, on, um, on what the companies, large and small, are thinking after we've gotten those proposals back. That would be, that would be a wonderful opportunity. Again, I share with Chair Holden on, on maybe that's a requirement. Uh, you never know until you ask, and they may not want to take that initial cost, but for the touch of business of eight plus million customers, I think they'll think about it. Thank you so much, Chair. We appreciate Thank that. Thank you, Council Member Vallon. Uh, any more questions from the Council Members? I do not see any more questions from Council Members. Chair Holden, do you have any additional and final questions for that? Uh, yeah, just a couple of more uh, uh, for the CTO. Uh, at the Smart City Summit in October, you mentioned a COVID data task force, also known as the Recovery Partnership. Uh, could you please provide more details on this initiative? Certainly. So um, 
there may be two different things that are being referred to there. Uh, one being the, the task force of, of really talented data scientists who volunteered uh, their efforts in the midst of the, the pandemic, the peak of the pandemic here in New York City in the springtime, spring of 2020. Um, so I mentioned earlier the work that we did with Harvard University using uh, aggregated Facebook data in different communities around the city to inform um, uh, where we needed to prioritize our efforts. That was an outcome of, of that work, of that, that uh, COVID data task force we call it the time. Now, um, after that point, uh, the mayor's office of data analytics um, recognized, I think a lot of the same potential benefits here of, of outside data being combined with city data or being made available to city agencies so they'd be better informed. And they created the COVID data recovery partnership, I believe is the, uh, the formal name. And that's being led by the mayor's office of data analytics uh, early on, they had over a dozen different companies that were providing uh, data to the city under a specific agreement for a, a certain period of time uh, for the purpose of, of COVID response and recovery. And um, I would have to check back with Moda to see the, the absolute latest in terms of numbers of participants and, uh, and, the, and the latest examples of how that data is being used. Uh, but it's something that we, we certainly are supportive of as an approach. In some ways, it's, it's reversing open data, just like we open up government data to make it useful to those outside of government, being able to take uh, government from uh, companies, have them offer that back to the city when they understand that it could serve a real purpose and really benefit the community. I think that's a great example of, uh, of civic leadership. So, so the task force is still meeting. Um, and, and are there any results of the work aside from the PPE uh, dashboard that we've seen? Yeah, so the, the task force is, uh, the task force that my office set up is, is no longer meeting. We, we didn't view that as necessary. And these were people volunteering their time, uh, which was a wonderful gift uh, um, of, of, to their fellow New Yorkers. Uh, the Moda Data Recovery Partnership is, is very much active. And I think that's that's where the, the current ongoing efforts are. Okay, one other question. And uh, uh, I'd like to sort of, it's sort of what I mentioned earlier on in, in the questioning about uh, one central portal that uh, residents of this city can get on and see everything. And mm -hmm. you know, like I mentioned, paying parking tickets, um, finding out where locations and making appointments for the vaccine, let's say, or other something else that, that uh, it's a it's a one portal um, that's user friendly that people can look at and really maneuver and um, you know find you know get get information they need. Uh, also, like I mentioned, um, performs other ci city um, services uh, or at least look for them. Um, do you see that portal coming in in the future at any time soon? Is it being worked on? Well, I appreciate the, the question and the way you're looking at the challenge. Um, the challenge is that we've got this information ecosystem in government that's, that's large. We, we provide so many services to so many different audiences. It's not all relevant to everybody. So how do you actually help people navigate that without forcing them to understand the org chart of government? Because that's not the right way uh, to solve the problem. Let's go back to, this, to the spring of 2020 and look at what we did in response to COVID. So initially, the focus was very much on, on health and uh, defining what the coronavirus was and, and what the potential risks or risky activities were. Um, pretty quickly, we realized that there was a more holistic challenge here, that families had to figure out whether the schools were open, what kind of support they could get as, uh, as renters, uh, unemployment insurance. There were just so many different things that people suddenly had on their plates. And it was important to do two things, to provide a front door, but also to provide no wrong door. And um, my office helped inform the approach that the city ultimately took, pivoting from nyc.gov slash coronavirus as a healthcare, a health, health department website to one that was citywide and really focused on the variety of different questions uh, or services that people might be, be looking for uh, from the city. So I think that's a good example of that kind of behavior being taken. At the same time, the no wrong door was really, really important. So putting up very simple, putting up a simple banner at the top of uh, government websites so that even if somebody was at a Department of Transportation website, um, they could see, oh, I can click here to go get more information about 
in that case, uh, the pandemic, because that was the emergency of the time. But even when you don't have an emergency, um, that's where you can look at, at what is often done with people who are interested in this, might also be interested in that. Giving people the ability to continue their, their information gathering journey uh, in a way that again is user-centered, user-friendly. And this is where having analytics in place is critical to make sure that we understand what that journey looks like and that we uh, are not simply uh, guessing at what those needs are, but we're really responding to demonstrated needs. All right, so the simple answer is we don't know. <laughs> uh, because I, I really need this, um, I really need something to be done going back to this uh, store locator. Mm. Uh, uh, website that tries to find us a vaccine and can't uh, without multiple, multiple steps. So uh, my vision is to get one-stop shopping on one city portal where we punch in our number and it recognizes us and it tells us what we're uh, eligible for, what how we can get some city services, how we can get our SNAP and, and so forth and so on. So the simple answer maybe uh, from you is it's still we don't know, um, but can we somehow look to a portal like that sometime in the future, do you think? I mean, could, could you, can, can I just get from you today that you're gonna look at this, uh, my, our comments on this, at least my comments about, you know, how, what a nightmare it is and that we can correct it in the future and try to get something where people can actually use it and be happy with it. I think we share the same goals. And when you think about any kind of web experience, web-based experience, very few of them are perfect when they start out. I might say none of them are perfect when they start out. So the question is how much do they improve and how fast do they improve? And I think that's how we need to measure success uh, in this case. And I can commit to you that I will uh, do everything I can and I will take what you've said to me today back and I will discuss that uh, with my colleagues to ensure that whatever I can do or my office can do to help, uh, we, we offer that up. Yeah, so yeah, because again, what's, what's the CTO's role in nyc.gov? Um, because I, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if you have a, a big enough role that you should have. I uh, appreciate that. And, uh, and, and ultimately, I think that's, uh, um, that's, that's a perspective that I'll no, but do, do you have a role? I mean, do you have a role at all? I mean, in, in uh, NYC.gov? Because I, I need to ask the question because uh, I don't want to, again, pressure you on this, but it seems to me that we need all hands on deck here. Yeah, and I agree. It's an all hands on deck moment um, right now. And we're all dividing and conquering and, and tackling the pieces where we think our skills are most needed or where there's simply uh, a gap at any given time. And we don't want to have too many cooks in the kitchen. I think that's, that's fair to say is that as long as we have the right skill set uh, at the table, we don't need to then replicate that five or six times over, but we do need to make sure that the right skill set is at the table. We need to make sure that none of these conversations. So we have to, well, we, I think we have to, yeah, I think we have to expand the role of the CTO, not to give you more work, but we have to, you know, update the description of the CTO especially during the pandemic, um, you know, uh, I, I just think, I just think that I would love your expertise on that. I would love to, to have your critique, uh, an honest assessment of, uh, you know, our technology in the city, especially yeah. in, in, in NYC.gov. I, I would love to hear uh, that. And so I, I just think that your, your description, uh, obviously, of your job should be updated. Has, I don't think it's been updated in a while. I, uh, I appreciate that. As of now, we, we do not play an operational role uh, like the one you're describing. Um, but uh, obviously, something I'm always, always happy to. Uh, but you would welcome that, wouldn't you? Because I know, I, I, just knowing what I know of you, I think you, you welcome a challenge. And I think uh -huh. this would be, I mean, I, again, the, the honest assessment yeah. You, like sometimes in, in dealing with government, you're banging your head against the wall, like I mentioned before. So to have somebody say, you know what, this this could be improved. You know, this NYC.gov could be improved and, and it should be improved to help people rather than you know, uh, offer, you know, put up more barriers um, in, in technology like we're seeing. So um, I'm sorry, but 
I just go off a little bit on that because I, it was very frustrating. Spent the whole day on it. I, I appreciate that, Chair Holden. And, and ultimately, you know, we're all here to, to make things better. And that's, uh, that's why it's exciting to wake up every day and, and do these jobs. Uh, and, uh, and we're going to keep doing that. Okay, I want to thank you. Um, uh, Irene, do we have any other questions from the uh, from council members? Yeah, hold on, I do not see right now any more questions. So I want to thank Mr. Farmer and we now turn to public testimony. I will be calling groups of panelists. Once your name is called to testify, our staff will unmute you and the surgeon at arms will set the timer and announce that you might begin. We ask each panelist to, to limit their testimony to five minutes. Council members will have an opportunity to ask questions after each panel of witnesses. I would like now to welcome our first panel to testify. Uh, uh, hold on one second. I just wanna thank uh, CTO John Farmer for your testimony. Um, I, I think we got a lot of insight today on the workings of, of the city. And, and I want to thank you for your, for your honesty on this, uh, on this uh, Zoom call. Thank you. Thank you, Holden, and thank you, Councilman Lugalone. Thank you. Thanks. And I want to thank you again. And we now welcome our first panel to testify. And the first panel will be Mr. Kamal Birvani, Stefan Velshorst, and Janine Bora. Before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Mr. Bivani, you might begin when ready. Time starts now. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Holden and members of the Committee on Technology. Thank you for inviting me to speak at today's hearing on smart cities. My name is Kamal Bivani. I am the Chief Executive Officer of GCOM. GCOM's mission is to help governments create healthier, safer, safer, and more prosperous communities by leveraging technology through our innovation and experience. I'm speaking to you as the CEO, but I am also speaking to you as someone who has held many technology positions throughout my career in New York, uh, in New York City government. My last position was that of overall chief information officer of all of the health and human service uh, agencies under the Bloomberg administration. The smart city concept, which has gained popularity within the last decade, has been about connecting the city's infrastructure. Examples include connected water meters, connected lights, connected cameras, connected environmental sensors. Uh, this technology has created tremendous value in understanding what is happening in real time with the city and has also cut down costs. There is no doubt that there is more to be done to instrument the infrastructure of the city of New York. However, the pandemic and its resulting economic crisis has shined a harsh light on the inequities that exist within the city. And that is the next problem to tackle as part of the evolution of a smart city. While the initial smart city concept focused on the internet of things, the next wave of smart city investment should focus on the internet of people. We need to focus now on human signals rather than machine signals. We know the aspirations of any democracy is to get all of its people into a place of self-sufficiency and well-being. Uh, it is well known that if you're poor, you're more likely to be sick. And if you're sick, then you're also more likely to be poor. By using technology and human signals, I believe New York City can drive better outcomes for its people and also for its businesses. This has to be done by taking a holistic approach, not a transactional approach. City agencies focus on transactions, many of them in person, whether they're dealing with individuals or with businesses, they don't deal with the end goal, they deal with the problem of the day. Even the transactions that people and businesses do online are focused on a program or part of an agency. People and businesses don't have an online relationship with the city of New York. They have an online relationship with the part of each agency that they have to deal with. Wouldn't be great for all New Yorkers to have one place to go for all aspects of their dealings with the city. The outcomes of self-sufficiency and well-being will drive incomes. As people are healthier and wealthier, the city will benefit. 
the new incomes will also even drive better outcomes as the city will have more capital to invest in new outcome-based programs. It is a virtuous cycle after all. Is this a pipe dream, you may ask? Is this even remotely realizable? My answer is yes. Just follow the examples of big tech companies who have invested in understanding the human signal very well. They're able to use that signal to drive outcomes. For them, it is about driving a purchasing decision at a, the very point in time when someone is likely to buy something that they offer. They understand that individual holistically, they know that by investing in understanding human behavior, they're able to influence behavior and maximize profits. Would it be wrong for the city to invest in similar technology to drive better, superior social and business outcomes? Couldn't we drive better educational outcomes, reduce poverty, reduce crime, increase commerce, and increase resident engagement? There are many issues to sort out in order to orchestrate this. Privacy, governance, cybersecurity, uh, budget, and many others. No doubt this is a situation where you have to measure twice and cut once, but the juice will be worth the squeeze. When I was a CIO in the city, many government officials from around the world came to see New York to see what we were doing and how we were doing things. It is time for New York City to leapfrog once again and show the world how it has used technology to solve the big problems as it rebuilds from the pandemic. The window of opportunity is now. Again, thank you for the opportunity to provide my thoughts today. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Bravani. I will be calling on Mr. Berhalst to testify. Mr. Berhalst, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Time starts now. Thanks so much, uh, Chair Holden, distinguished uh, committee members. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Stefan Verhulst. I'm the co-founder of GovLab, or Governance Laboratory, which is an action uh, research center based here at New York University. And our mission is to look into how do we transform the way we make decisions, how we govern using new technologies and new methods. And particularly, one area that we have explored is the area of how do we reuse data in order to inform public decision making. Data that was collected by the private sector, as uh, uh, Mr. Farmer has indicated, how can we start using that data in order to inform public decision making and as a result, improve people's lives. Now, I had the privilege two years ago to uh, testify in front of this committee uh, where I advocated for the creation of data collaboratives new kinds of public-private partnerships where the private sector and the public sector works together in order to reuse data and generate insight that can be made actionable within a city context. Obviously, since then, COVID-19 has only emphasized the need to really leapfrog and accelerate the creation of data collaboratives and smart cities, such as the use of IoT and other connected devices will make the need for data collaboratives even more pronounced. Now, in order to have a trustworthy environment for data collaboratives, we also need an increased engagement with citizens and residents in order to understand what is their expectation with regard to the reuse quite often of data that they have disclosed with the private sector. And so that's an area that we have explored over the summer because we believe that in order for data collaboratives and especially the reuse of private sector data to be accelerated, you're gonna have to need a social license in order to start using that data for other purposes than the purpose for which it was collected. Now, what we set up over the summer was what we called the first ever data assembly within the city which was a citizens assembly around the reuse of data for COVID-19. We basically held three mini public deliberations, one with data holders and government officials, one with uh, uh, civil uh, rights organizations and community uh, representatives, and one with New York residents itself. And what we tried to do was to really understand 
what are people's expectations, their concerns with regard to particular kind of exhibits, such as the use of mobile phone data, or the use of bank data, or even the use of 311 in order to understand, for instance, noise violations. What they felt was appropriate, and more importantly, what would be a framework, as uh, uh, Mr. Framer has identified, a framework for actually reusing data in the public interest. And so the result of those three mini publics, which we held over the summer together with the Brooklyn Public Library and New York City Public Library, and which was supported by the Henry Luce Foundation, the result is A, a responsible data reuse framework, where we can clearly understand A, why is data being reused? Who is using it? For what purpose? When is it being used? I.e., are there limitations in the data and the data retention? Where is it being used? How is it being used? And ultimately, what's the impact? And being able to clarify those simple uh, W questions, uh, you would establish a far higher trust in actually how the data is being reused. So that was the first outcome. Second outcome were a set of cross sector recommendations. A key one here is if we want to engage with the public in a meaningful way, we have to invest in data literacy. I mean, it's great to have a conversation about aggregated and anonymized data. The public at large has no idea what aggregate and anonymized data means. And so we need to invest in actually data literacy to also have them become agents in how the data is being reused which ultimately could have tremendous impact on how the city is governed and how we ultimately deal, for instance, with COVID-19. So my suggestion to the committee is to really uh, consider how we can provide for more legitimacy in those data efforts by establishing data assemblies in the long term, by having a regular check-in with residents in order to expire. their expectations, and then subsequently also to then build frameworks that would instill trust in how data is being reused and how ultimately those insights can improve people's lives. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Happy to take questions. Thank you, Mr. Berlhurst. We will, I will be calling on Ms. Boda to testify. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Holden and committee for giving me this opportunity to speak about noise and quiet. Um, I am affiliated with the noise and health committee within the environment section of the American Public Health Association, but I'm also involved with a lot of other um, noise groups and soundscape groups. Um, I suggest that any discussion of smart cities should involve a component of um, noise sensing or sound sensing and monitoring and use of the information to reduce excessive noise in residential areas, and including using direct ticketing as what happens with speed cameras. Um, I propose ultimately a request for proposals for pilot studies to test the use of sound sensitive te technologies to monitor and report excessive and illegal vehicle noise, including but not limited to loud car engines, motorcycles, and drag racing noise aggressive non-emergency horn use, including locations with chronic horn use, uh, vehicles that are broadcasting loud music on residential streets, especially as entertainment for social gatherings, not just passing through. And I also propose involving members of the public, possibly school children, um, maybe by having contests in which the winner or winners would get to have a pilot study in their neighborhood. Um, I, I was only planning to speak for a minute or two. So uh, again, I thank you and I welcome questions either now or in the future. Thank you very much, Ms. Boda, for your testimony. I will now turn over to our chair for questions. Well, thank you, Ms. Boda, for, for that testimony and for the uh, certainly the uh, submitted testimony that you gave to the committee. Um, Again, you're, the subject of noise is near and dear to me as someone who's lived in the city all his life. Um, I can tell you the city has gotten noisier and it's unhealthy and many neighborhoods have, you know, we, we had a sound meter, by the way, installed in um, years ago, the congressman um, got some money for, uh, and I think it was an NYU study 
on um, not only not only uh, air quality but noise. And we found out our ambient noise was over the limit. Since I live near an expressway, um, we we fought and got sound barriers installed on the expressway because of the sound meters. But there are many locations around the city that experience a high level of noise, and that needs to be mitigated, obviously. Um, and your ideas on other cities, I'd like, I'd like some additional information if you have on how it's working in other cities, these monitors, these noise monitors. Um, could you, do you have any more that you can add to your testimony? I don't have more than I can add to my testimony now, but I can provide that in the near future. Because it's a, I'd like to certainly, um, if we can look as a city council as a whole can look into this uh, and uh, uh, certainly fund a study, uh, do, um, Ha, you know, even create a task force to look at this problem because New York, I remember Mayor Bloomberg um, had uh, uh, a program called Operation Silent Night. Do you, do you remember that? And it got no, it went nowhere. It actually, did, nothing happened. And I remember being part of, uh, excited about that program. Do you remember that at all? I'm familiar with it and I, I remember it, but I don't know how it, how it sort of Ended. Yeah, it really was calling for the enforcement of, of noise uh, um, violations in certain neighborhoods that, that were identified. And I guess they had no way, of, no, no technology at the time to do that. Um, but again, the, um, it, it, it was a press release that the mayor's, uh, Mayor Bloomberg issued. Uh, in fact, even uh, my students at CUNY, uh, design students, got to work on the poster that would hopefully, you know, spread the word. And, and it, again, it, they, they never... Um, actually called us back. They never really um, used a, uh, any any of the the projects the students did because they kind of dropped the program. And I'd like to like the city uh, at least to look at that. But your ideas are terrific. I thank you for your testimony um, and uh, certainly uh, for your you know great ideas and, and um, printed uh, matter that you sent us. Thank you. Um, just uh, I just want to ask. Uh, let me just get to. Uh, uh, Mr. Brawani, uh, it's great to see you again. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I, I love you, some of your ideas. And uh, could you detail the outcomes you mentioned and give some more examples for the city? Sure. As I was saying, the, the goal of the city, obviously, is to get people out of uh, poverty, get them into um, self-sufficiency and also into better health. And when you think about the human signal, I was referencing something called the human signal. Uh, it's in other parts of your life where the human signal can be picked up. So for example, no one wakes up one day and wants to be a felon. They've done some other crime likely, maybe a misdemeanor. The point of intervention and prevention comes earlier than when it becomes a problem for the Department of Corrections or they become a prison. Uh, when someone is having learning issues, by the time they are dropping out of high school, there's a pattern of behavior. There are signals that show up before, the human signals. Uh, so there's a whole variety of these. Uh, same with homelessness, uh, same with job training. Uh, there, I think there are a lot of ways that the city interacts with, it, with people, its residents, and even businesses. And the, and the signals are there. Comstat was a good example uh, many years ago where there was an, an increase of violence and crime in certain neighborhoods, and there was a police force that went to prevent it. Uh, so I think it's a matter of, of understanding what those signals are and then uh, preventing the the wrong outcomes and encouraging the right ones. Right. Um, it certainly Thrive NYC could uh, could uh, use some of the data to track some individuals that have been in and out of the uh, criminal justice system and uh, are, are just, uh, nobody's monitoring them, it seems. Um, and uh, uh, obviously there could be measures taken to prevent some of the, the possible uh, violence that occurs later on. But, um, I, you know, uh, I, I understand you're doing some innovative things in other cities to modernize governments. Can you share some examples uh, with the committee here today about on best practices? Sure, GCOM uh, works with uh, about 22 states, not just some cities like New York. Uh, for example, in Maryland, uh, we are one of two companies that is helping build the one-stop portal uh, for residents of Maryland so they can interact with government in a central point at a certain a central place. Uh, I know the city's complex, as uh, the CTO mentioned earlier, um, but, and, but many companies are complex. Apple's complex, Amazon is complex. Uh, when you would never do business with a company 
that didn't give you a one place to log into and get all your needs serviced. You just wouldn't. You wouldn't download 100 apps, log in 100 times, fill in your information over and over. You wouldn't tolerate it. Residents of the city are forced right, to pay taxes. And they expect, I think, a frictionless experience. Uh, so we have done that type of work. We've done some of that work in the city of New York. We did something called uh, Payer Dispute. We have an app that we built for the city. Uh, and there, it's for the Department of Finance. People can either pay or dispute a parking ticket. Ironically, it's a highly rated app. You would think an app where you pay parking tickets or, or other motor vehicle tickets would not be highly rated, but it is because it's simple. You can dispute it quickly. You can add a photo or you can pay it on the spot. It's very quick. It's seamless. And it's a mobile app, not just a website. So those are two examples, one in the city of New York, one in Maryland, but we have many others, uh, including telehealth and other things that we've built for the WIC program uh, that have made you know, more, a more frictionless experience. You described the vaccine problem. Uh, it's ironic that even teachers had to sign up and tell the city that there were teachers in order to get the vaccine. The city knows who the teachers are. So these are examples where we just haven't dealt with the human signal. So in the, the state of Maryland, you're doing their, you did their one-stop portal. Uh, are they dealing with the vaccine through this portal? They're not, they're not. This is a, a fairly recent initiative and we have, they're layering on one program at a time. They've gone with an umbrella contract uh, and that umbrella contract allows uh, flexibility in procurement. So they can later say this agency wants to do this or the priority of the administration is this. In general, most places uh, have done the vaccine through a separate procurement because of the urgency and speed. But these are, these are not likely long-term kinds of projects. These are short, quick-term, fix-the-problem-now projects, which I think have been folded into the long-term issue. Yeah, so you heard my, uh, my comments on that portal in the city, nyc.gov. And um, uh, has, has any city that, I mean, I, I'm maybe putting you on the spot here because uh, uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with um, the, the portal of nyc.gov. I guess you are. Um, and you know some of the problems if you've tried it. Yeah. Um, and um, are there any cities that have a, a portal that I can look at or the committee can look at and say, this is great, this is working. Uh, this, this actually is user-friendly and people can understand it and get around, uh, other than the Maryland one that you mentioned. There are very few in the US. I think uh, countries like Norway and Estonia are, are further along than the US when it comes to these things, believe it or not. Wow. So, but, but you, your vision would be that we could have a portal like that and it would be uh, that somebody could punch in their number and get, uh, you know, do what I mentioned. And, and, it's, and it, shouldn't, shouldn't be, it shouldn't take years to figure this out, right? Um, because you've done it already. Yeah, we started a program called HHS Connect when I was uh, in the city of New York uh, to be able to create a centralized place for benefits, social service programs for the city, about 35 social service programs. We started with online school meals uh, for people to be able to apply for online school meals rather than a paper form, which sometimes gets lost. Uh, and we extended that and, uh, to many other things. Uh, and that project started in 2007. And by 2008, we had launched online school meals. So this is not back then was more expensive and more difficult. Now it's much easier uh, and much more streamlined. The issue is not technology. The issue is the coordination and governance uh, and allocation of budget and some of the other issues, the strategy, giving it, giving it the authority and empowerment for one person to do this. Uh, I think that's more of the problem right now and it's the orchestration, it's not the tech. Well, thanks, Mr. Barwani. Um, and I, I thank you for all your great work, by the way. And uh, thank you. And uh, hopefully we can meet soon and talk about some other initiatives. Uh, you may have some ideas um, that we could uh, implement as, as part of nyc.gov. Uh, Mr. Verholst, um, just I want to thank you for your tremendous work in the city on this uh, on the issue. We, we will examine your presentation with the committee staff. But uh, in your opinion, what is the best way uh, to create trust with the general public? Um, and uh, should the city engage in public forums? I think you mentioned something like that, but um, what's the best way that we could start off in, in just um, you know, gaining the trust uh, of the general public? Yeah, I think, thanks so much, uh, Chair, for the, the question. I think uh, there are a variety of ways in order to increase uh, trust. One is, of course, transparency, where you actually have a clear understanding on how data is being reused what data is being used, what's the purpose. And so that's the framework that we have shared 
and that was a result of actually co-creation with the public uh, that can uh, advance trust if you would have a better understanding on what is actually being done with the data. But there are other mechanisms as well. And as, as we said, uh, deliberation on a regular basis in order to understand the expectation is going to be very important because it's not a binary uh, position, right? Citizens and residents are not for or against, it depends. And it's very important to understand what are they more comfortable with, what are they less comfortable with, and what would make them more comfortable and more trustworthy by actually having that kind of engagement and by engaging, also explaining what is it that one seeks to happen. And then lastly, I would say, what is quite often ignored is what do residents really care about with regard to what kind of questions they would like to see answered with data. Too often, the questions that one seeks to answer are not the questions that have been sourced from the public or from critical stakeholders. And so one of the other initiatives that we have advocated for and which we are developing at the global scale is something called the 100 questions initiative, i.e. what are the 100 questions in New York City that citizens feel if answered, their lives would be better. And if you would be able to actually have a demand from the public, as opposed to a top-down kind of demand that these are the questions that will be answered, you will instigate more trust because it would be citizen and people-led as opposed to quite often led by those that have the data. All right. Um, uh, talking about the, uh, do you use the New York City's open data portal uh, when you work on your projects? Yes. Meaning open data is one of the areas that uh, um, GovLab is focused on uh, uh, as well. Do you have any comments or concerns with the open data portal? Well, again, o meaning open data in New York City is uh, well developed and, uh, and I would uh, congratulate the legislators that were uh, uh, visionary to also develop an open data law, which is uh, unique uh, uh, as it relates to open data. And I would say, that's definitely a plus. But again, I'm gonna come back to my 100 questions. What we see in open data worldwide, including in New York City, is that it's very supply driven, i.e. you push out data, but you don't really have a clear vision with regard to what are the priority questions for which we would like to share data. And so if we would combine the supply of data with actually a better understanding of the demand, that can be sourced by either the public at large, or you would have a dedicated kind of what we call committee of bilinguals, i.e. people that are domain experts in the city and also data experts that they can say, these are the hundred questions that we would really, that we really need to make advance for, give us the data so that we can actually start answering them. That would be a more demand driven open data project then ultimately looking at what data can we share without having a clear understanding to what, what end and what kind of question do you want to answer. Great, All right. thank you. Uh, could you elaborate more on the social license proposal? Yeah, by social license, we mean having uh, uh, the, the those that are included in the data sets, have them agree on how the data is being used. And social license is a well-established uh, concept quite often in the natural resources space, but also in the space as it relates to statistics. I mean, the uh, statistical agencies worldwide are active, active because they have a social license in using data about citizens to inform society. And I think we need to have uh, that social license also within data collaboratives. We can see, for instance, in cities such as Toronto, where they failed to acquire a social license before they started, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the, um, um, the, the Smart City initiative that ultimately was stopped recently. And so absent that kind of social license, it's very hard to gain the trust afterwards. And so that's why we feel uh, to really invest in that, understand what are the expectations and also be clear on what is being done so that you acquire that social license. Well, th uh, thank you all. Thanks uh, for your tremendous uh, testimony. Very enlightening uh, and uh, very, very good panel. Uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Lander, 
Uh, and I want to thank this panel. Thanks so much for your testimony again. Thank you. Thank you. And at this point, I do not see any questions from other council members. And I would like to move to our next and final panel. And our next pan panel will be Noel Haldalgo, Albert Fox Khan, Daniel Schwartz, and Clayton Banks. Mr. Haldalgo, you may begin when ready. Time starts now. Hello. Hi. Um, thanks for having this really appropriate and open conversation about the future of uh, smart cities. Uh, first, Beta NYC would like to acknowledge the administration's involvement in uh, Cities for Digital Rights Coalition. Uh, as a founding member, New York City has made a global commitment to promoting and defending digital rights. It's great. We love it. Um, to ensure that we retain our rights into the 21st century, we need consistent technology leadership inside of the mayor's office, across agencies, and in council. With the ebb and flow of inconsistent leadership prior to John's arrival, um, uh, we ask that the council and public advocate via the chair of Commission on Public Information and Communication convene a study group and identify concrete strategies to ensure that New York City government has consistent technology leadership through the next administration and beyond. Uh, this will include auditing and inventorying existing systems, which is something that has been very difficult to do through Do It, uh, reforming mayoral offices and agencies, which is something that when you're dealing with such a large system like New York, it's been nearly impossible. Uh, Ex explicitly improving procurement policies uh, and, and civil servant hiring practices, uh, and when, then where needed, introduce new legislation. Uh, the pandemic has made the digital divide wider than ever. To bridge this, we need consistent and well-informed and properly resourced leadership. We need to openly investigate the harms that technology causes, uh, ensures that community input is integrated into these services, that our privacy is protected, and that government can hold these systems accountable. A truly smart city can balance all of these things. For the last decade or so, we've been told that the smart city is just around the corner. We've been told that smart trash cans will minimize overflowing trash cans, smart traffic lights will eliminate congestion, cameras will keep our kids safe, microphones will tell us where guns are being fired, and artificial intelligence will tell us what the next problem is to solve. And let's be clear, these are marketing campaigns that digitally wash over the complexities of government, logistics, and infrastructure. None of these smart city tools address the root issues of service delivery, infrastructure investment, and interagency coordination. Rebecca Williams, an old friend and a technology public purpose fellow at Harvard School of Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs has submitted written testimony. And for the record, I would like to echo several of her well-researched points. First and foremost, every new piece of smart city technology introduces potential harms. Many times, these tools are deployed without community input. Many of these tools are sophisticated surveillance devices that erode privacy and Fourth Amendment protections. They have a chilling effect on First Amendment rights, and the tools have led to digital redlining and further causes discrimination and oppression of communities of color. Lastly, they can lead to the loss of an accountable government, as we have seen with the conversation around tools for law enforcement and predictive analytics. A truly smart city can ensure that our legal rights are protected, money is not wasted, and our civil servants work smarter, not harder. And we hope that the council can help us get there. Thank you. Thank you very much for your tes testimony. And our next panelist is Albert Foxconn. Time starts now. Thank you so much, Chair Holden, and to the committee and to committee council for the opportunity to testify today about really the immense impact that the transition to smart cities programs will have in the coming years for New Yorkers. I, I will be submitting a written testimony that details a number of our privacy concerns, ethics concerns, concerns about fiscal responsibility with these programs. But I wanna to respond to some of the um, proposals we've heard here today, because I think this has highlighted in microcosm a lot of the broader problems with smart cities development. I, I wanna to turn to the proposal to have 
acoustic monitoring of New York City. This is something that's actually been proposed in other cities and been become a point of controversy. And it actually, in the case of Toronto, where we saw a massive investment in smart cities and an attempt at doing one of the largest smart cities uh, um, development projects in the world, it, it, led to, it was one of the factors that led to that proposal being eliminated. And, and there, people were quick to point out what is true here that if you install microphones around New York City for the purpose of collecting noise levels, those microphones are just one software update away from becoming warrantless uh, uh, wiretaps, tracking New Yorkers as they go about their lives, data that will be going to the hands of NYPD, going into the hands of other agencies. And you know, even if you don't look at the uh, potential for abuse by law enforcement and the potential for abuse by ICE if they obtain the data through information sharing agreements with the city and other federal agencies. There's still the problem that we're creating a giant point of vulnerability. We saw in the Solar Winds uh, uh, hack uh, earlier this year a massive exploit, a, a coordinated effort that undermined the cybersecurity protections. Of, the, of some of our most secure federal agencies. New York City will continue to be a primary target for those sorts of hacks. And if we're creating these massive repositories of personally identifiable information, if we're creating this entire web of surveillance tools, being even if they're being deployed for laudable purposes, they are just one hack away from being used by people we do not want controlling the information uh, on thousands or millions of New Yorkers. You know, I, I really want to echo something that uh, Mr. Hidalgo brought up in his testimony. There is a really problematic track record here. We keep hearing promises that smart cities will close the divide, that they will provide more equity and equality, that they will help uh, remedy uh, systemic in injustice. We don't see that in practice. In practice, we've seen automated uh, fraud programs in Michigan which were designed to identify potential benefits fraud, which were wrong over 90% of the time. People being driven into bankruptcy and being uh, in some cases driven to suicide because uh, of faulty algorithms. We've seen medical algorithms constantly uh, augmenting inequality, depriving communities of color of vital medical care. And, and you know, when we talk about the potential for broad-based surveillance measures that would use expanded camera systems, expanded monitoring systems, expanded automated tracking. We have to not just look at the way that these systems are supposed to work in theory, but how they're likely to be abused in practice. Because as we spent quite a bit of time detailing earlier in this session with the city's response to COVID-19 and our faulty and really frustrating platform, for accessing vaccine, even at a time when we're just asking for a relatively simple platform to find out where people can sign up for uh, COVID-19 inoculations, we haven't been able to roll that out smoothly. So the idea that we're gonna provide this incredibly expansive tracking system that is able to use all of these different data inputs to track the public and not fall down this into the same uh, uh, consistent problems of, of bias and invasion of privacy. I I just don't believe it. And I, I really think that the emphasis here should not be on expanding the data we're collecting, but protecting the data that's already being taken by an already invasive array of, of surveillance measures. You know, here, I, I would lastly note that we cannot talk about smart cities and the ramifications of these programs without talking about the NYPD and comprehensive privacy protections and rolling back the surveillance powers that have been abused by the NYPD for so many years. Thank you. Time expired. Thank you, Mr. Khan, for your testimony. And our next panelist is Daniel Schwartz. Time starts now. Thank you. My name is Daniel Schwartz, and I'm testifying on behalf of the New York Civil Liberties Union. We thank the chair and council members for holding this hearing and for the opportunity to provide testimony today. At its core, smart city is an umbrella term covering a wide range of urban surveillance technologies. 
as sensors and software increasingly merge our digital and physical environments and new forms of data collection, analysis, and automated decision-making are deployed in our public environments, we're crossing a tipping point. Network devices through this, throughout the city allow for the persistent, invasive tracking of practically every New Yorker's whereabouts and associations. And software tools make invisible decisions impacting people's fundamental rights in welfare, education, employment, housing, healthcare, the family regulation system, and the criminal legal system. Link NYC, the public Wi-Fi kiosks run by Alphabet or Google subsidiary Sidewalk Labs has after years of operation still not disclosed a detailed list of sensors included in the kiosks, nor how Link NYC uses the personal information it collects in its ad-driven business model. The NYPD's domain awareness system integrates more than 20,000 public and private cameras, automated license plate readers, short spotter audio, audio sensors, and environmental sensors. It consolidates previously siloed databases, and it offers a combination of analytics and information technology, including pattern recognition and machine learning. The increased use of such analytics and predictive policing systems is worrisome given the NYPD's history of unconstitutional and racially biased stop and frisk practices. Utilizing police data will create false positives and investigative recommendations reflecting these practices. The COVID-19 pandemic has in many aspects increased urban surveillance, as we've heard earlier. Airtech providers were quick to offer mass location tracking data, surreptitiously collected and shared without notice or consent at various scales and levels of granularity to national, state, and local governments. That includes New York City through the Recovery Data Partnership. Data broker Experian started tracking and micro-targeting people most likely to get hit hardest by COVID-19. And it is now used for ID proofing on the website that Chair Holden mentioned earlier. Police departments deployed drones with thermal imagery sensors and biometric recognition software, such as heart rate, sneezing, coughing, and distance detection. And above all, the crisis has reified and deepened many inequities and laid bare the great impact of lacking access to technology and broadband internet. In the absence of meaningful privacy legislation at the state and federal level, we will continue seeing massive privacy privacy violations, and we risk rolling out technologies that do not meet people's needs. We urge the Council to create protections and regulations to ensure our civil rights and liberties are protected. As we outline in our written testimony, this means increasing transparency and oversight as a baseline requirement, severely limiting data collection practices, banning discriminatory technologies such, such as the use of face surveillance by city agencies, and ADS that show discriminatory impact against any class protected under the New York City human rights law, and providing equitable and safe technology access to those in most need. New Yorkers should see their lives enhanced by 21st century technology, not become victims of it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Schwartz, for your testimony. And our next panelist is Clayton Banks. Time starts now. Well, good afternoon. I'm sorry, Mr. Banks, I think you are still on mute. Hi, this is Clayton Banks. Um, good afternoon to all Chair Holdman and members. Um, I am the Chief Executive Officer of Silicon Harlem, and I thank you for this opportunity to testify. It's always fun being the last person because you feel like you're maybe becoming a little bit redundant in this situation, I think that's a good thing that you're hear hearing a lot of us aligned around smart cities. Silicon Harlem is a telecommunications and infrastructure technology team. Our expertise is in fact, smart city strategies and it spans from broadband and sensors to virtual and uh, autonomy. And when you look at that type of infrastructure, you really have to take into consider some brand new strategies on how to, how to manage that. Most conceptions of a smart city revolve around data, whereas our concept revolves around people. We have a goal to ensure that deploying smart city initiatives do not create another digital divide. And since we all know that could happen, we have an opportunity to really preempt it here in New York City that will lead the entire country. Uh, that being said, our goal today is to offer some key strategies, key strategies to really preempt the next digital divide and ensure that
that a New York City smart city is designed to serve all. Let me start with this. I believe that our first strategy should think about targeting the distribution of new emerging technologies that often follows economic incentives and results in inequitable distribution. The city should examine the location and siting plans of smart city pilots and assign priorities to underserved communities. Our other strategy that we would recommend is to include advanced universal access and disability justice. You know, when you're dealing with a smart city, that has to be on the table. The city should work with organizations that have expertise in this area and co-design with the disability community to establish the equivalent of an ADA compliance standard that guides ac uh, accessibility in our smart city. Another strategy is to establish a civic tech trust that has more flexible, it would have more flexible contracting policies to hire underrepresented technologists from our public schools and support community workforce development programs. We got City College sitting right in the middle of Harlem. We would love to utilize that university more often. We love the MITs and the Harvards and all that kind of stuff, but you got great assets right here. We would like to see the city create social responsibility standards and key equity indicators integrated into the framework of any smart city project and investment. We asked the city to consider and utilize crowdsourcing based applications. We talked about noise today. That would be a great crowdsourcing based application. Incentive features um, uh, to encourage everyday New Yorkers to engage in the city's expanded smart city open data. It is important for the city to push for smart city projects to have participatory budgeting and auditing while we are co-creating processes with the community and use plain and multilingual languages in the terms and conditions across all projects. We also encourage the city to integrate and in time, I'm sorry, we, we ask you to do a anti-discrimination impact analysis into the contracting process of smart city projects. The impact analysis and an accompanying statement would factor in the approval of smart, pretty, uh, smart city projects to protect NYC vulnerable communities. Example, racially biased facial recognition as an example. Finally, we advocate to prioritize bridging the connectivity gap. If you've read, read anything about Silicon Harlem, that's our number one thing. Uh, you can't have, this is my line, you can't have a smart city if even one person is not connected. Right now we're seeing a digital divide, even with the vaccine. Uh, we heard Chairman Holman talk about going online and there's many people that can't go online and get an appointment to get a vaccination. So some of the places that are offering it in Harlem, you don't see people that would normally be in those lines because they don't even know about it and they can't get to, uh, to, to schedule. The city, the city could mandate smart city projects to contribute to the funding of internet connectivity Smart city projects should contribute to basic needs of underserved communities to get connected to the internet for access to smart city applications, online learning, telehealth, and remote work, and so forth. Thank you for I'm the inspired. opportunity to testify on the oversight smart city hearing, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Banks, for your testimony. And I will now turn it over to questions from the chair. Well, thank you all on the panel for your excellent testimony again. And uh, I, I have a couple of questions uh, and I, I want to just uh, direct my first set of questions to Noel Hidalgo from Beta NYC. Um, uh, Noel, is he unmuted? Yes. Oh, yeah, there. Okay, great. Uh, firstly, uh, I would like to thank you for your hard work, especially in uncovering that brilliant that that brilliant tech minds on the city's payroll were left out of the uh, the vaccine rollout. And uh, do you have an update on whether some of these agencies, city agencies, or offices have finally been asked to assist in fine tuning the vaccine finder website? Um, I I will say that uh, I don't. As of what is today? Today's Tuesday, so. I think last Thursday, uh, Friday ish, it, the the after our press conference, um, there hasn't been um, any immediate follow up. Um, I know that um, P 
people inside of the mayor's office have raised their hands. Uh, they have once again expressed their desire to uh, uh, address these issues. Um, you know, they are eager to, to solve the challenges, the information challenges that have been uh, uh, very present since March. Um, they are ready, willing, and able to tackle the city's greatest challenge in 100 years. Um, and and they are, they're still waiting to be called back. Yeah, that's, a, that's uh, uh, but it's not, a, it's, it's predictable, I'd say, with, with the administration so far that I've seen. Um, you would think they would reach out to some of their experts and design experts. Uh, I think I know the answer to this, but has the city contacted Beta NYC for guidance or advice? Uh, uh, besides council members asking who to call and who, who, to, who to chat with or what organizations inside of the mayor's office, no. Yeah. Um, so uh, how would you rate the city's digital uh, government services, uh, you know, specifically the implementation of the web design, uh, you know, of their web design? Uh, I don't have a, a scientific matrix to work with, but um, what I can tell you is that uh, the digital divide, even inside of New York City agencies, is 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 vast. Um, we have some agencies that have very sophisticated notification systems. Um, uh, you know, like I remember several years ago hearing from how uh, Notify NYC works with uh, OEM and and the police department and FDNY, and how there's a comprehensive you know notification data stream out to uh, a number of different entities that need to know you know the most pressing security issues uh, in New York City from from the UN to our our top tourist attractions to federal agencies. So there's there is comprehensive. Uh, um, understanding and information flow. We have one of the smartest cybersecurity uh, uh, institutes um, inside of city government through Cyber Command. Um, but then at the same time period, we don't see the investment when it comes down to um, uh, kind of the public side of technology. Um, and so, uh, you know, like the, the fact that nyc.gov um, has looked pretty much the same way for the last 10 years. Uh, is really troubling um, that the infrastructure that powers NYC.gov is, is running on TeamSite, which is uh, a tool that we have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for uh, just to have the license and the privilege to, to host NYC.gov versus using open source software uh, where we can invest that, 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 those licensing fees into talented technologists uh, and designers who can help improve NYC.gov. So you know, it's 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 a shame that that we have such a wide digital divide inside of our city government, and I think that that really speaks to the fact that um, we have an administration at the very top, and I do mean that the mayor uh, doesn't see this as a priority to be investing in. Um, it's it's just you know, it's it's like bike lanes. Um, why change something when you don't use it? Yeah. Yeah, you've tweeted out several times and have mentioned to me in meetings that there is a city commission on public information and communications or COPIC. Uh, I know it was established uh, in 1989 in the amendments uh, to, uh, to the city charter and that the council presides over these meetings. I know that it, it is tasked with publishing the public data uh, directory. Um, and that is the, this, it has responsibilities, uh, providing education and outreach to assist the public in obtaining access to city information. And, and it's and among other things, it, it, some, it develops strategies and so forth. Um, I believe the last time COPIC has met was in 2012, is that correct? Uh, no, pretty much every public advocate has had a one COPIC hearing. Um, and I know that Clayton was one of the, the COPIC uh, members. Um, the last COPIC meeting that I was privileged to attend was when uh, Corey Johnson was the acting public advocate. Um, and and, and uh, then Speaker Johnson slash acting public advocate uh, Johnson uh, had a had a really an amazing multi-hour public hearing inside of city city council chambers um, to really dig dig into kind of the breadth of issues that Copic could be uh, engaging in. Um, we're actively Beta NYC is actively working with uh, count, uh, Public Advocate Williams uh, to reinvigorate Copic. Um, we we know that some of our um, elders inside of the good government community think that Copic's uh, day has has come and passed. 
uh, a majority of the powers of COPIC now reside in, in the city's open data law um, as well as within do it. But as we can see time and time again with the deficiencies and updating of our city's municipal public information websites, um, there needs to be a public body that, that has the legitimacy uh, to make some really clear demands on how to improve um, all aspects of our digital information streams from now from APIs, uh, you know, to uh, uh, websites, to applications. Uh, we really need to have some mechanism that the public uh, can engage in and, and express its viewpoint um, on how to ensure that the public is kept up to date um, on, on government information. That's one thing. The second thing is we're still struggling to get that open data, um, excuse me, the, the data catalog that was published in April of 1993. That is the last, that is the last physical version of an assessment of all of the different technology systems inside of New York City government. In 2001, the Bloomberg administration uh, updated that document, which gives a comprehensive view of, um, uh, of a listing of all the different computing systems. So it's been close to 20 years since we've, we've had that catalog. Um, and that catalog is fundamental for the arguments that NYCLU, STOP, and other good government groups, uh, as well as uh, social justice organizations are demanding um, when it comes down to the accountability of these automated decision-making systems. We need to know what type of technology is being bought, purchased, and built inside of New York City government so that way we can have justice and we can have proper accountability. COPIC's role is to help make sure that we have a public version of that directory. And so, you know, for these two reasons, I still feel that COPIC is uh, valued in the 21st century, public information and accountability for technology systems. Thank you, Noel. And by the way, we got the information that COPIC didn't meet uh, since 2012 from nyc.gov. So, so you could see uh, there's a need here. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Noel, so much uh, again for everything. And uh, I just want to ask the three remaining panelists um, um, who have some privacy concerns. Um, and this could be for any of you, uh, the uh, three that, that have test, uh, testified. What kind of data should be most protected? Um, I, I, I'm happy to go first, and then uh, uh, Daniel, um, please. Uh, you'll ha I know you'll have uh, amazing contributions as well. You know, so we're concerned about data that is both based off of the type of data that's being collected and who has access to it. So on the one hand, we think that uh, biometric data, data which can be used to track individuals such as facial recognition data, geolocation data such as the um, data associated with our cell phones from the cell tower and uh, from the apps running on smartphones. Those, that type of information when held by police in particular we think is quite alarming. Uh, and you know, I don't think this is a partisan issue. I think that we've all seen ways in which uh, you know that threat of, of you know having automated enforcement or you know really or surveillance-driven enforcement of criminal laws really strikes at the heart of what we think of as our you know constitutional rights to privacy. And the other hand, you know, data. Um, related to health uh, needs to be protected uh, quite uh, clearly. So here in New York, we recently enacted the first ban in the country uh, on uh, transferring uh, contact tracing data to third parties, including police and immigration. And part of the reason there was because of the privacy threat, but a big part of the reason for that legislation, this was up in Albany, was because we knew that people would not take part in contact tracing if they thought there was any risk that the information from th that uh, public health campaign would then be used for uh, policing purposes or immigration enforcement. So, you know, that's another uh, set of information that needs very strong legal protections. Fully agree with everything Albert has said. Um, more, more specifically on the biometric data. And I think the council has recognized some of the harms by enacting legislation for businesses to um, ban the sale and sharing of biometric data um, and at least provide notice um, and signs to customers that are in a business where biometric recognition technology is utilized. Um, but as mentioned, and as 
in more detail is outlined in our written testimony. Um, specifically, face surveillance has no place in government. Um, it's, it's an invasive system that allows the tracking without notice or consent of anyone. It is discriminatory and it is um, particularly inaccurate for women and black people. Um, but perhaps to shift it away from also the, the data focus, it, it is perhaps even more important um, now that we're talking about smart city technologies to look at, look at the various implementations of the system. So there it is so context specific of what the right protections are. And um, the CTO has mentioned earlier and also um, Noel Hidalgo from Better NYC highlighted the Cities Coalition for Digital Rights. And the five key and core principles that, are, uh, that the city committed to in 2018 are completely spot on. The problem is really that in the two and a half years since they signed on to that coalition, little has happened to actually hold the various technologies and systems um, to these principles and implement the, the var various policies that are outlined there. And this is Clayton Banks, if you don't mind, I'll just say a quick word that um, data is, uh, important to some person and another person doesn't care. So data is tough to say, you know, what, which one's important. I, I would say that the city of New York ought to really embrace um, how we treat data from the perspective of law, logging and, and processing it. And I believe that the future will be distributed ledgers, what you've heard with blockchain and things of that nature, which can keep a lot of anonymity when it comes to uh, people and, and, and processes that we have going on in a smart city. So more to talk about that, but definitely a distributed ledger will help us get towards a much more, not only transparent, but very much a protected uh, bunch of databases. Um, thank you. Thank you all. Um, just one other last question for anyone. Um, this is a very broad, very general question, but maybe you might have some specific uh, recommendations. What can we do to protect privacy and still benefit from data obtained by smart cities technologies? That's very broad, but I understand that. But does anybody have any, you know, I know getting into the hands of the wrong agency and so forth, but is there anything else that you would recommend? Um, because obviously this is your area. Uh, yeah, I, I, I will hop in by saying, you know, what, what Stefan from, from GovLab um, one thing that he said was was right, which is um, we need to see that data uh, that there is a set of of literacy um, that needs to be baked into the conversations around data. Um, and through the work that Beta NYC has been doing, um, from educating the public to educating community board members to council members and staff um, and to other government officials, is that 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 literacy level, just like math or science or facts or or, or language, uh, has many different stratas. And so. Um, in our outreach and in our conversation of, about the smart city, um, we need to be baking in those conversations. You know, the, the NYCLU, STOP, and, and other advocates um, in the conversations of the lead up of um, the, the publication of the automated decision making uh, task force report uh, had a massive event in, in um on the Upper West Side that, that did a, a community education where we talked about ADS systems. We talked about what privacy is being violated. We talked about kind of like the access to these things. Um, and, 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 you know, we, we, we worked in such a way that helped bring the, the language of technology uh, to people. And, you know, uh, Silicon Harlem does a great job of doing that on a, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, up in Harlem, you know, through meetups, but it, it has to be a, a concerted effort to make sure that people understand um, what is at stake um, and what rights may be uh, uh, given away when you hit that terms of service. That's like one thing. The second thing is let's let's use that literacy that that we have collectively as as these very smart, passionate individuals, and let's create legislation and policy that really protects those things so that way uh, our, our neighbors who are are concerned about taking care of their kids or their parents or you know they don't have to necessarily be so concerned about their privacy in the 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 smart cities era right like we should be privileged to take our our understanding and to protect their privacy that's our role as advocates and as academics and as legislators. Um, and so for me, it's those two things. One, push literacy and let's do our job to protect people. 
Thank you. Uh, one thing I'd like to add, uh, I think, um, you know, we believe, uh, as Noah was saying, we have to have this small d democratic approach to engaging in this debate. So we've had an amazing track record in New York with participatory budgeting, for example, which has brought community members into the debate about how we spend our dollars to invest in our communities. And there's no reason why we can't have that same level of engagement in smart cities development, where it's driven by, uh, you know, people at the community board level, at the, uh, in, on the council level and not being just driven by the mayor's office. I think we've seen this being a process dominated by the administration in a way that really undermines that uh, democratic accountability because all too often they are asking for public insight as an afterthought. They are asking for uh, feedback once they've already identified the problem, identified the solution, and then are moving forward with a possible uh, implementation. But they should be hearing from New York communities upfront about what are the smart cities pro uh, programs we need. Because oftentimes, if we are using these systems to solve problems that communities don't believe exist or in ways that they don't want them, uh, supposedly solved, we're going to potentially create more problems than we create benefits. And, and so I, I also think that, you know, while um, it's somewhat counterintuitive, the more we can ban the most abusive forms of this technology, the more we can build public trust in the beneficial form. So for example, if New York City were to ban government use of facial recognition, something that NYCLU, my organization, STOP, and countless others have been calling on the city to do for years. And uh, that would go a long way in building trust about the additional forms of less invasive and less discriminatory smart cities programming. But right now that trust deficit is so severe that it's hard to really get public buy-in for systems that could at least in theory be more uh, beneficial than harmful. Thank you. Um, I, I agree fully with both, what both Noel and Albert said and perhaps add on in addition to the literacy and the community um, engagement aspect and community decision making um, to increase the transparency and that was something that was mentioned in several testimonies but if if these smart city projects no matter whether it's um, re recycle bin street lights or the link NYC or perhaps even taking link NYC as an example um, after seven years now, we still don't know what the 30 sensors on the kiosks are. We don't know how the ads driven business work network functions. And without the transparency surrounding these technologies, um, trust won't be there from New Yorkers. And um, it's clearly possible. Often, oftentimes government officials push back around um, open source technologies. But as we've seen with the um, COVID smartphone app, it is based on open source technologies that is um, supported by Linux Public Health Foundation. And I think if the will is there, um, it is definitely possible to um, follow the public money, public code initiatives that um, Barcelona has been um, um, pioneered. Yeah, good, good points, uh, Daniel. I appreciate if I, that. If I could just simply say, representing Upper Manhattan and, and being able to walk around public housing and and, and sort of interact with a lot of people that are, you know, already pretty paranoid because of the amount of surveillance and things that go on in Upper Manhattan. Most of the buildings have lots of cameras. There's already a public trust issue there. And even when Link NYC was deployed and we fought very hard that it, that it hits Harlem quick, a lot of, we found out a lot of people were like, are these sur another surveillance on us? So, I think, Chair, Chair, that you are absolutely spot on on how do we, how do we move forward with that. And I, I encourage you to look at some of the strategies that I put into, inside my testimony and have submitted it because there's great opportunities with, within uh, the CTO's office, uh, COPIC, and all of that by embracing some of these uh, strategies that get everyone to the table. That's really the key. Thank you. Thank you, Clayton. Um, any council member questions uh, for this panel? No, Chair Holden, I do not see any questions from other council members. Thank you all for your tremendous testimony uh, and information. We're going to, uh, we should meet so at some point all, with all of you. Um, I hope we can meet in person, um, but uh, we have a lot of work to do and um, 
your expertise is so vital to this new, to this city. Uh, it, we're going to really advance as a smart city. So thank you all. Thank you again, and um, I'll turn it back to uh, turn it over to council. Thank you very much, Chair Holden. I also want to thank all panelists for their testimony. And if we have missed anyone who has registered to testify today and has yet have been called, please use the Zoom raise hand function now. And I do not see anyone at this point. And I will turn it over to Chair for any final closing remarks. Thank, thank you so much. And I just want to acknowledge CTO John Farmer is once again, he made it to the end of the, uh, of the hearing. I want to thank him. I want to thank him for his testimony and for listening, which uh, many uh, heads of agencies don't stay on the call or stay on the, the hear, at the hearing. And I want to thank him again for his expertise and his, his testimony. Um, so uh, I will uh, close this hearing. This, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you so. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good week. Thank you.